So we're looking at the practice test for Unit 2. Uh, question 1, the following graph can be written in the form of, you see the ingredients there. What we want to do is identify the different components of A sine BX plus C plus D. All right, so, and, and there are a bunch of different possibilities that we can use, but essentially what we want to do is come up with a graph that has, or the equation of a graph that has this output, all right? So first thing I notice was that this one seems to have an amplitude of two. So if I go from my midline, which seems to be the y axis, I'm sorry, the x axis, all right, let me make that a thinner. So my midline is the x axis, which, which implies that there is no vertical translation. So that suggests that my D value should be equal to zero. All right, so that's midline is the equation Y equals zero. So that's one less thing to worry about. Now the difference between the highest point and the midline is the amplitude, and that happens to be two units. All right, now over this interval of zero to two pi, just looking at that singular interval, oh, that's weird, Over this interval, it looks like I have a complete sine wave, which is ultimately what we want. All right. We know that the distance necessary to complete one full cycle of a trig function is known as the period. So the period is equal to 2 pi. And then there's a couple of different ways that we can come up with the, the B value from this. One would be to set this equal to 2 pi over B and solve. The other way is more intuitive because the frequency is the number of complete cycles within a 2 pi distance from the origin. We have one full cycle in that 2 pi distance, so that tells us that the frequency is going to be 1. But if you solve this equation, you get b equals 1 anyway, and b represents the frequency. All right. But for the amplitude, we look at it and we say, okay, well, the a, the, the a value could be 2 or it could be negative 2, right? Because the amplitude is an absolute, right? So it's a question of is it 2 or is it negative 2, right? I don't appear to have a phase shift going on. So there's two ways to figure out the, the type of a value. Uh, so we know that there's no phase shift. So I could put a 0 there because this is... A, a sine wave that's complete in one full period of zero to two pi, right? It's not an incomplete sine wave, all right? But the, the two ways to figure out uh, the, the sine of the A value, one would be just by, I would say, like rote knowledge, and that is an ordinary sine wave would look like this, and this is the reflection of that over the x-axis. And what do you do when you want to reflect something over over the x-axis? You negate the equation, or you negate the expression. All right. So that's one way to think about it. The other way would be to use this Desmos app that I've had up here. Uh, you can find it on Blackboard. All right. So I put my 1, my 0, 0. We're good there. All right. I just kind of bring it in on the relevant part of the graph. And in order to do that, I hit on that little wrench, negative 2. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, this one is 0. To 2 pi ish, a little bit more than 2 pi. And then a little bit less than negative 2 to a little bit more than 2. So I'm just going to zoom out a little bit to make it kind of look the right way. All right? So what I have here is the exact opposite of what I want. All right? If I were to make this a 2, it would, it would just be even more the exact opposite of what I want. All right, it's still one full cycle of the sine wave. All right, but if I make my a value negative two, you see now that now we're in the territory of what I do want. If I can get it to stay on the negative two, which is always a challenge with a touchscreen, and then I got that little uh, jammy there that's showing up. But <clears throat> this is really what we're up against now. I have um, my domain restricted on this. So I can expand it out a little bit more if I want. So I can make this go on and on and on. 
doesn't look like I'm making it go on and on and on, but I can adjust my sliders here. Oh, I hate when that happens. Try that again, shall we? Using a technique I like to call the right way. All right, so anyway, this looks exact, almost exactly like the graph that we have on paper here. All right, now if you're not sure, you can run through it a little bit and test some points. At pi over two, we have a coordinate uh, of negative two, a y value of negative two. Run the x-axis, three pi over two, we're two up, it looks good. So that means that my coefficient here, my a value, should have been a negative two. All right. With phase shifting, it's a little bit more complicated. If you have a phase shift, you're going to use the formula negative C over B. All right. So let's say, for example, I had my graph shifted over. Uh, I'm going to have it shift from an ordinary, oh, I'll have it shift from the negative sine wave here. I'll have it shift by negative, oh, I'll, I'll actually make it a, a measure of pi. Negative pi over two, for example. All right, so let's say you were given a graph that looked like this and you needed to make a sine function out of it. Now this looks like a cosine wave and that would actually be pretty easy to write. But they're, if they're saying that we want it as a sine function, then we have to do it using a phase shift. So what I would do is I would look at this and say, all right, well, where does the sine part of this function start? All right. If it were a sine function, it would start right here, all right? And then we'd have one full wave between these two points. So that's offset by negative pi over two, all right? So if I know the period, and that, that would help me figure out the B value, I can use this phase shift. The phase shift would be negative pi over 2. So for example, negative pi over 2, I'd set that equal to negative c over whatever the b value is. In this case, it would be 1. And that would give me the c that I'm looking for. All right. So I'll just snip this graph and put it in there so it's a little bit more uh, obvious what I'm talking about when you go to look this over on your own. Copy, done, delete the screenshot. So I'll just kind of chuck this in here. That was weird. I apparently encountered an issue uh, syncing my iCloud. That's not what I hoped to see. All right, so let's move this over. I'll move this down. Oh, that, that took off on me. It's like a catastrophe. All right, so I'll just move this over here, here, I guess. I'll call this example. Yeah, so if you have a phase shift, and in this case, you would know it's a phase shift because you look at the, look at the graph and say, well, this is what the sine function would look like. This is what the sine function would look like. And it's offset by pi over two units to the left. And that would get us to three pi over two over here. The period is two pi. And so that's where all this stuff would come from. All right, so just so you have it. All right, the next one, I'm gonna resize this. So tiny. I'll also zoom in, but for now, I just want to make it a little bit bigger. What's the equation of the quartic function? So quartic is fourth degree equation, so power of four, shown on the graph. So for this, this brings us right back to the beginning of the unit. We identify the roots. We have a root here. X equals one with a multiplicity of two, and that's because it looks parabolic around that root. All right, each one of these roots are a multiplicity of one because it looks linear. So x equals negative one, multiplicity one, x equals three, multiplicity also of one. All right, so 
And what I'm going to do is I'm going to define my polynomial. So P of X is going to be equal to some coefficient K multiplied by X plus one, because I need my factor corresponding with the first root. That would be to the first corresponding with the multiplicity. X minus one multiplicity two and x minus 3 multiplicity back to a 1. All right, so then the only thing that remains is figuring out the value of k, and then, if necessary, depending on how the question is phrased, distributing this out. All right, not always necessary to do that. depends on how the question, like I said, is phrased. All right, so what I do is I grab a point that's on the graph, something I haven't accounted for yet, like, for example, 0, negative 6, plug that in, for x and p of x and use that to solve for k. So simplify, we get negative 6 is equal to k times 1 times another 1 times a negative 3. So negative 3k is equal to negative 6 making k equal to a 2, all right? So p of x is equal to x plus 1. Oh, sorry, I forgot my 2. That was the whole point of what we just did. 2 times x plus 1, x minus 1 squared, x minus 3 to the first power. So what I'm going to do is graph this. P of x equals 2, paren, x plus 1, x minus 2, uh, x minus 1 squared, x minus 3. I'm going to structure my domain and range to be consistent with the graph on paper, negative 2 to 3, negative 10, to 10 going by 10s. And as long as it looks, as long as it looks like the, uh, the graph on paper, then we're in good shape. All right, it looks pretty good. All right, good looking W graph. All right, our intercept here is at zero, negative six, so I'm in pretty good shape. All right, so if necessary, I have to distribute this out. So we, I'm just going to assume that it's necessary. This part, x minus 1 times x minus 1. And we have x minus 3, and we have everything else. All right, so a little distributive property. You can organize it any way you want. It actually kind of makes sense to put these two together because it's difference of perfect squares. Hang on to the two for very for the very end. But this would become x squared minus one because the outers and inners would cancel out. Then distribute this, x squared minus four x plus three. Then it's binomial against trinomial instead of having maybe a couple of trinomials against each other. And right, so I'll run through with the x squared to each one of these terms. So x squared times x squared, x squared times negative 4x, x squared times 3. So x squared times x squared is x to the fourth. x squared times negative 4x. It's going to be negative 4x cubed. x squared times the 3 is going to be 3x squared. So then negative 1 multiplied by each one of these terms. So negative 1 times x squared, negative x squared. Negative 1 times negative 4x, positive 4x. Negative 1 times a 3, negative 3. Combine our like terms, x to the fourth. And we would have minus 4x cubed plus 2x 
squared plus 4x minus 3, all of that multiplied by 2, and we'd have our polynomial 2x to the 4th minus 8x cubed plus 4x squared plus 8x minus 6. And so I'm just going to pop that into Desmos and make sure that that gives me the correct answer. And by correct answer, I mean the same graph that we plotted using the, uh, the unsimplified form or otherly simplified form. All right, so it looks like they mapped to the same locations. So we're in pretty good shape, and we have our solution. Number three, state the x-intercepts of the graph. You know, this is kind of like one of those gray area type questions because if it says just, you know, it asks the question just the way you see it here, it could imply, you know, just pop it into Desmos and see what you get. But you got to be prepared for complex answers too. So you never really know what to expect. So let me type it in and see, you know, see what we're up against. X squared. Minus 5x plus 2. All right, so I got 1. That's a nice one. So not, not terrible in terms of our answers. But if we have to show work, then it, it isn't just a matter of saying x equals negative 1, 2 thirds, and 1 half. We need to justify it. All right, since we're dealing with a cubic, that implies synthetic division. So what I would do is I'd snag one of the roots here, take my coefficients, use synthetic division to divide by one of those roots. Negative one is the cleanest one. We started off with a power of three, so our result is gonna be power of two, power of one, Power of zero, backfill with some plus signs. So we're looking at 6x squared minus 7x plus 2. Result is equal to zero. If it's factorable, you factor. If not, you go to the quadratic formula or completing the square. All right, so we're looking at 2 and 1. Uh, 2 and 1 actually wouldn't make sense in that regard. It would be the other way around. And the reason why I recognize that the two wouldn't make sense over here. Oh, actually, let me not undo too much. If I put the two here, then we have a GCF. If there's a GCF here, then there must have been a GCF in the original. And there wasn't, so that two can't be there. It has to be here. All right, so we got 3x, 4x. If they're both negative, that would give me a negative 7x. So we're in good shape here. And also, we know what the answer is supposed to be, so there's that. So 3x minus 2 equals 0. 2x minus 1 equals 0. Solve, you get x equals add 2 divided by 3, 2 thirds. Add 1 divided by 2, 1 half. All right, so my x-intercepts, also known as roots, zeros, x equals negative one, two thirds, and one half, and in, in any particular order, it doesn't matter. All right. Number four, oblique asymptotes. An oblique asymptote will exist if in simplified form, so you factored everything, you simplified everything as far as it can go. Afterwards, you check to see if the power on the top is exactly one more than the power on the bottom. So 1, 2, negative 27 are our coefficients. We take the x minus r corresponding with the denominator. Hmm. 
and so we get r equals 4. So whatever the r value is, the root corresponding with the factor associated with the denominator, pull down the 1, 1 times 4 is 4, 6, 24, negative 3, drop the remainder here, and write a linear equation out of the remaining coefficients. We started off with a power of 2, so our answer would be power of 1, power of 0. So y equals 1x plus 6. So x plus 6 would be our oblique asymptote. So that, that one should be pretty easy comparatively. Number five, quotient and remainder. We're just using the skill of synthetic division here. And the structure of where, how you're gonna respond is a little weird, but it's still um, consistent with the way we've done it in class. So this is really the same as saying three X to the fourth plus zero x to the third minus two x squared plus zero x plus one. Our coefficients three, zero, negative two, zero, and one. All right, so three, zero, negative two, zero, and this one got cut off, so let me just kind of pop it back in there. It'll be correct on the test, but a little iffy here. All right, so one there. All right, on the outside, x minus r gives a result of one. So we pull down the three, multiply, you get a three, add, you get a three, multiply, you get a three, add, you get a one, Multiply, you get a 1. Oops, poor quality 1. Add, you get a 1. Multiply, you get a 1. Add, you get a 2. All right. So this is the remainder. All right. So we're writing the quotient and the remainder in this little tiny box, which expands on, you know, on Blackboard, but for the sake of not shrinking it down too small, I'll just write it here. You would write, because this is the power of three, this is really the same as saying three x cubed plus three x squared plus one x to the first, or just x, plus one x to the zeroth, or just one, plus two over x minus one. But on Blackboard, the way you would type that is three x and then use the caret symbol to the third, all right, that's shift six. Plus three X carrot two, then plus X plus one, that's fine. Plus two, then division, parentheses X minus one, close parentheses, all right. So it's kind of kind of a pain to type in, but it makes it so that the auto grader can handle it a little bit easier, and then you get your grades back quicker, and everybody's a little bit happier, I guess. All right. Remainder theorem. Now for this one, it's only the answer that we care about. Oh, I'm sorry. Of course, it's the only answer. Only the answer we care about. It's only the remainder that we care about. The remainder is the answer. All right. So we have 4x to the fifth minus 3x to the fourth. We're missing a power of 3, so 0x to the third plus x squared plus x. We're missing the zeroth power, so plus 0. All right. So our coefficients here, 4, negative 3, 0, Understood one, understood one, and zero. All right, so four, negative three, zero, 
one, one, and just like the last one, it'll be correct on the test, but here. Oh, so my highlighter's in the wrong place. Sorry about that. Uh, actually, you know what I'll do? I'll just split this last one. One, one, zero. And it's just the remainder that we care about. All right. The number on the outside for synthetic division is going to be whatever's contained within the function evaluation, I suppose. So negative three. Oh, you know what? It was, um, I apologize. It was perfectly fine. I, I got thrown off by my own notation here. All right. So let me just fix this. This was all right. I just I started writing in the wrong place. Like a like a schlamingo. There we go. I still stand by what I said. It will be right on the test, but it also happens to be right here. All right, so bring down the four, four times negative three, negative 12, plus the negative three is negative 15, times the negative three is 45, plus zero is 45, and negative 135, negative 134. So it's multiply, add, multiply, add, multiply, add. You know, it starts getting a little kookier after that. So getting a calculator involved is not frowned upon. All right, so negative four, uh, positive 402, sorry. So 403. And then uh, multiply that 403 times three. That's gonna be 1209, this time negative. Add that to the zero, you get negative 1209, and that should be our answer. So I'll check this in Desmos, because that should be equivalent to what you would get if you typed in f of x equals your original function and then just typed in f of negative 3. So you have 4x to the 5th minus 3x to the 4th, oops, 3x to the 4th plus x squared plus x. And so I do f of negative 3, and it says negative 1209, so we got it. All right, so you can see why the work is important here, because you can get the answer. The answer is easy enough. It's the work that I care about. All right. Number 7, determine the values, value or values of x that satisfy the equation. All right, so we get a nice log equation here. I'm going to rewrite it, just a little kind of nicer. I'm going to use the dot as multiplication symbol, log base 8 of x minus 2 equals 0. All right. So we need to satisfy this equation, but in order to do it, if we're going to do it by hand, we need to use some properties of logs to kind of clean it up. First thing, I mean, it isn't even really a, a property of logs. It's just something we want to keep in mind, is that this is just a minus 2 kind of off at the end. So if we can isolate that in some capacity, that might be helpful, but we'll see. All right. So looking at this first, I notice we have a power rule situation. So this would be the same as saying log base, oh, why did I write base 3? No, nobody knows. Base 8 of 3x times log base 8 of x cubed minus 2 is equal to 0. All right. Now, it is, I, I know I, I used the dot form of multiplication just to keep it looking nice, but it is this multiplied by this whole thing. All right. So I don't want to lose sight of that, but I also wanted to kind of keep it looking somewhat organized. But now that I've, I've sort of pieced things together a little bit differently, you know, using the properties of logs, I can go back to the parentheses notation. 
So then what we'll do is apply the zero product property, which basically tells us the two factors set equal to zero, so take each factor and set them equal to zero. Now we can convert each one over to exponential form I'm using that circular motion. Eight to the zeroth power is equal to three x. Eight to the zeroth is equal to one. Divide both sides by three, and you get x is equal to one third. Nice cancellation here. I'm going to add a two to both sides, and you get log base eight of x cubed is equal to two. Eight squared. So 8 to the second is equal to x cubed. 8 to the second is equal to 64. Cube root of which is equal to 4. All right. If you don't like that technique, graphically, assuming the question doesn't ask you to do it in a particular way, you can type in miscellaneous log base 8 of 3x oops right arrow 3x and we make it y equals I tend to forget that I don't know why y equals we're putting the left side in as one equation we're putting the right side in as another all right so exactly as you see it base 8 It's of x minus 2. Close it up. See where it's equal to 0. So y equals 0. y equals 0. All right. And it's equal to 0 at this location, which is 1 third. And if we go on down the line here, we see it's equal at this location, which is 4. All right. And there you go. Number eight, a word problem. Suppose the population of flies is growing exponentially. On May 1st, there are 50 flies, and on May 18th, there are 600 flies. How many flies will there be on May 28th? All right, so n equals n sub zero times one plus r to the t power. That's the exponential growth formula. Right, we're starting off with 500 flies. We're ending up with 600 flies based off of some unknown rate of growth, but it's going to take 18 days to get there. All right, so divide 6 over 5, 600 over 500 is 6 over 5, 1 plus r to the 18th power. And then I would raise both sides to the 1 18th. So 6 over 5 to the 1 18th is equal to 1 plus r because 18 times 1 over 18 goes to 1. Subtract the 1 from both sides. And you get the rate is equal to 6 over 5 to the 1 18th minus 1. All right. Now, that, so that gives us the rate. That still hasn't answered the question. But now we could actually create our model. And actually, we only really needed one plus r. We never really actually needed the r itself. But it's nice to know. Because we could put this in decimal form and get a sense of what the rate of change is. Right. But if I want to come up with the actual equation here, dependent on time that would give some final quantity a final amount I would say n I would say n is equal to 500 times 1 plus r so just kind of going back a step here if you look at this you see that we know what 1 plus r is equal to 1 plus r is equal to this expression here it was only after we subtracted the 1 from both sides that we saw that r would be something else but 1 plus r which is what's in the parentheses, 
is equivalent to 6 over 5 raised to the 1 18th power. All right. And that whole thing would be raised to the t power. I'm just going to clean up this paren. It looks hideous. All right. Now, if you multiply your exponents, you end up with kind of a nice, concise equation here where n is equal to 500 times 6 over 5 to the t over 18 power. All right. Now, I'll just put this back into play here. Slide it back up. But that would be a function that would model the number of flies after a certain period of time in days. All right. So for part A, how many will there be on May 28th? That's 28 days later. So I'd just find N of 28, which would be 500 times 6 over 5 to the 28 over 18. And then we'll answer the second part. But for now, just popping it into Desmos, or TI if you want, but Desmos for now. I'll use um, F of X, or F of T actually. Doesn't matter, but try to use a little consistent. You could really use N of T. We'll do that. 500, open paren six over five. Close paren, raise it to the open paren T over 18. So we would have a function here if we have the appropriate domain. I'll go from 0 to 30. It's treating T like an X, so the, the X axis domain would apply to T. And then zero to, well, it's going to increase from 500, so let me put it up to 1,000 and see what happens. Got some graph there. So N of 28, which would be in this neighborhood over here somewhere. You could actually just kind of scroll along till you get it. But you could also just type in N of 28. So that's going to be approximately 663.958 flies. All right, I'm not an expert on flies, so I don't um, pretend to know whether a decimal amount of flies would make sense. All right, so um, I, I, I never liked the uh, the idea of you round just because you think you should round. Like you can't have 0.958 of a fly. That's what people would say, so you'd round. And I'd be like, who said? I mean, really, who said? I have no idea, All right? So uh, unless you have some, some insight into the uh, the biology of flies, uh, I would say just leave it in, in a rounded form, uh, unrounded form. So decimal values are fine. All right, so for B, on what day will the population have doubled? Well, I'm starting off with 500, so doubled would be 1,000. So that's going to be equal to all this stuff couple of ways to handle it now that we have it into a calculator. One way to do that would be to graph y equals 1,000 and see where they cross. It says on what day. So t is approximately 68.432 days. So that one is weird because it says on what day, right? So you'd actually have to count on down from, uh, or count on up, I suppose. So you'd have to count from May 28th, I'm sorry, May 1st, 68th, and part of the 69th day, All right? So let's see. 30 days has September, April, June, June, and November, all the rest of 31, and I, I never remember the rest of the rhyme, but uh, so May has 31, June has 30 days, 
At least they didn't do it around February, so that's good. So we're up to 61 days. All right. So we're into July. July 7th would put us on the 68th day. So it looks like July 8th. Number nine, a tow truck with a beacon on its roof. Well, that's an interesting one. A tow truck with a beacon on its roof. What kind of beacon are we talking about? I'm assuming it's talking about a siren here. All right, so I'm just calling it a beacon. Uh, it's two meters from a wall. As the beacon rotates, a spot of light moves along the wall. The beacon makes one complete rotation in two seconds. An equation describing the movement of a spot is given. All right, where D is in meters and T is in seconds. When T is equal to zero, the beacon is shining perpendicularly, perpendicularly to the wall. How far has a spot moved after one eighth of a second? All right, so that, that's kind of kind of a strange way of putting it, but um, but manageable. So we'll start off by looking at the graph. All right, so let me clear all this stuff out. We'll call it, well, they said D, but I'll use, I'll use F of T again. I may want to evaluate the function. So two, function, trig, go to tangent, pi over two T. So pi over two T, look at that graph. That's fun. All right. So, we obviously want to clean that up a little bit. We don't want to just kind of look at that graph and say, okay, yeah, well, we, we, everything makes perfect sense here. Uh, it's going to come down to the, well, let me thin that out a little bit. Statement here, the beacon makes one complete rotation, so one complete cycle in two seconds. All right, so that's an indication of the period. All right, so let's change our domain because obviously this is going from 38 to 85 isn't gonna cut it. I can do this, I can hit the home screen, it makes it a little bit nicer. But it's saying that I only wanna go out to a value of two. All right, so our domain, the relevant domain that we care about in this instance is gonna be from zero to two. Now, tangent function is infinite in the y direction, but now we've kind of cleaned this up to something way more manageable because it was disgusting a minute ago, but now it's, it's like I said, manageable. All right, so what this is asking us, again, is how far the spot has moved after one-eighth of a second. Well, D is in meters, and D represents the, um, the distance. All right, so again, I'll, I'll just read it a second time, uh, or at least the relevant part. An equation describing the movement of the spot, All right? So there's a spot of light that's moving on the wall, and there's an equation that, that demonstrates this movement, all right? What we wanna know is what's happened to the spot between t equals zero and t equals two. I'm sorry, t equals one eighth. Zero seconds and one eighth of a second. All right, so if we figure out d of t, which in this case, you know, based on, the, I, I suppose I could call this d. I gotta get into that habit. It's the same function, but at least now I'm not asking people to remember, oh, f means d, but, so D of zero, all right, that, that's a location that's perpendicular on the wall, but from our, um, perpendicular to the source of light. But from our perspective, we're saying that it, it has traveled no distance, all right? So that's something to keep in mind. It has not moved at all.
All right, the result is equal to zero. And again, this is in meters. All right, so then what I would do is type in D of one eighth of a second. All right, D of one eighth of a second. And then from there, all I would really be doing is rounding appropriately to get something in the neighborhood of like 0.398 uh, meters. All right, so 398 meters, I'll move this over so I could actually write the word meters. All right, so it hasn't traveled at all at time t equals zero. At time t equals one eighth, and apologies, I should have put the actual numbers in here. I did it on Desmos, but I didn't do it here. What, what it's telling us is that it moved about, I'll say about 0.4 meters. All right, so all we're doing in this one is just really evaluating a function, but that function is trigonometric in nature. All right, if it were a sine function, maybe it would say it was like something along the lines of what's the furthest distance it traveled, you know, because a sine function oscillates, it increases, decreases, increases again. So then you'd be asked for the amplitude, you know, it, just different aspects of a trig function, but you got to interpret what the question's asking in order to know what part of the graph is relevant. All right, that's the tricky part. Uh, number 10, last question. Write log base 2 of 125 minus blah, blah, blah as a single logarithm. All right, so these are properties of logs. So we have the subtraction and we have the addition. We go left to right. All right, and it's order of operations, really, uh, just kind of sort of in reverse. We have quotient rule. So this would become log base two of 125 over five. And that's still plus log base two of three, which we could combine using product rule. All right, now it just so happens that 125 divided by five is something that you could actually figure out 125 divided by 5 is equal to 25. So I could write this as log base 2 of 25 times 3, which in turn would become log base 2 of 75. All right? You could go further to get a decimal answer, but that's not what the question's asking. All right? It's asking us to get down to that single logarithm. All right? And there it is.